Welcome to Zoom at Times TV, and here's your host, Anita Finley. Hello, everybody. I'm Anita Finley, and I'm your Zoomer Times host today. And I've got the celebrity author of Boomer Times and of the world, actually. It's Darwin Porter. You've heard him for so many years with us. When we had our radio shows, you see his column every month. He is a celebrity to us, but he is to so many people because he knows things that nobody knows. And I have no idea every time he comes on what he's going to say, but I know it's clean so he can say it. Hello, Darwin Porter. Hello, Anita. So good to see you. And uh, speaking of celebrities, could, could you, spe speaking of celebrities, I have a quick story to tell you before I get to the main meat of the day. Okay. Uh, filming has begun again at Magnolia House, being arranged by Dan, being arranged by Danforth Prince, and um, on Saturday, a film was made here uh, with a notorious celebrity, and the deal was that uh, it was all done by a legitimate company. Uh, the name could not be revealed because they said paparazzi and reporters would be banging on the door to get a look at this notorious person. And the deal was that we, uh, Mr. Prince and I and anyone connected would go to the upper floors with a catered lunch and stay there during the oh. entire process and leave, come down then when the celebrity disguise has departed. Now we started to speculate. Was it Bill Cosby? He's back out of prison and he's starting to talk about giving interviews. And then I heard Stormy Daniels is in town uh, and the people want to talk to her because if people don't remember her, uh, she's under, there's part of the investigation going on right now with our former president. But I'm just speculating. All I know is it was someone really notorious. And now that's all. I can't tell you who it was because I don't know. That that's is very me. unusual for you, Darwin, that you're left out of that. I'm surprised. Well, obviously this must be a very controversial person. But anyway, I'll move on. Uh, what I really wanted to talk about is something from my own life. Uh, for those who don't know the term, there's a term called judgment of Paris. It's an ancient term. Basically, it's for people who follow along a road and the road then turns left and right and you have to make a decision. For example, a woman might be sort of in love with two men, but she has to make a decision to follow only one, unless she wants to be a bigamist. <laughs> and, and I spent all my teen years planning to be a newspaper reporter. The Miami Herald approached me and hired me. They sent me to places I'm sure you visited called Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach. <laughs> and I was having a wonderful time. And then they shanghaied me to Key West. And uh, it was a, a great time to be there because the Castro people were ta taking over in Cuba. Uh, the first Cubans to arrive were in mink coats and diamonds and yachts, and the rich always uh, escaped first. It was a hot news beat, many stories. And of course, you know, I've always been devoted to movie stars. Well, guess who the first three stars I got to view? Cary Grant, Tony Curtis, and Dean Merrill, who at the time owned Mar-a-Lago. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. they were doing Operation Petticoat. Then there was a producer named Stanley Heiger, a TV producer, and I heard he was in Port-au-Prince and he had become engaged to an actress called Anne Bancroft. She had just made a sensation on Broadway in uh, uh, The Miracle Worker. She would later film it and win an Oscar. I had seen her first film. Uh, it starred Richard Widmark and Marilyn Monroe playing a psychotic babysitter. A psychot I'm not making this up. It's called Don't Bother to Knock. Oh, that was the only time she played a role like that. So when he and Miss Bancroft uh, 
returned to Key West, I called him and I said, I would love to interview Miss Bancroft for the Miami Herald. Uh, he said, well, I'm sure she would be willing. Uh, how about three o'clock tomorrow afternoon? I said, I will be there. I arrived at three o'clock. Would you believe I left at midnight? It was, one, it was one of those incredible bonding friendships. You may have had those in your life. Yeah. The friendship just, now I had a rich friend who owned the state of Tennessee and he had this big yacht. So I invited the, uh, Mr. Haggard and Miss Bancroft to go with him and he sailed us to these obscure islands. We found an old battleship left over from World War II. In other words, we really bonded. They were there 10 days. On the final day, he called me in with Anne, and I called her Anne by then. He said, how much do you get paid by the Miami Herald? And I said, uh, $125 a week. So he said, oh, starvation wage. I said, well, <laughs> uh, uh, I, he, I said, um, well, I can afford one turtle steak a week. We <laughs> ate turtle steaks back then. And he said, how would you like to, I'm the president of an advertising agency on Madison Avenue. How would you like to come to work in New York? I will pay you $500 a week plus unlimited expense account. Oh my gosh, I'm falling off my chair. And he said, don't worry about where to live. Anne and I, I took two big town townhouses in New York and cut through on the second floor and made them one. They're tw 22 bedrooms. You can have a suite on the top floor free. And he said, you'll also spend part of the time in Hollywood. Anne and I live in this big house. And of course, this is Anne before Mel Brooks, obviously. Uh, Anne and I stay in this big house in Pasadena. She's going to be making movies, but there's a six room cottage in the back. And I said, six rooms, that's great. Uh, it overlooks a cliff, so don't get drunk one night. And uh, so you that will be your California address. And I so said- wait, Darwin, wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Did you die and think you went to heaven or did you really believe this is true? Well, uh, they're very, I mean, Mr. Haggard had a very good reputation. I mean, in, in the business. And for example, he, he talked, he had gotten Joan Crawford to endorse Coca-Cola. I said, Joan Crawford is married to the head of Pepsi-Cola. He said, well, before Pepsi-Cola, Joan Crawford endorsed, she was trying to hide all the posters. He said, you've heard on the TV that, that uh, see the USA and a Chevrolet sung by Dinah Shore? I said, oh my God, everybody in America has heard that. He said, Century Shirts Call, and uh, they wanted an actor in a white shirt and tie. And I found this B picture actor. He was endorsed, he was the MC at a burlesque show in Las Vegas and he had $9,000 in the bank. And I hired him and he said it was this B picture actor named Ronald Reagan. Oh no. So he hired him to do the white shirt. And so he, he was totally le legitimate. And the first day I moved in, I met a young composer who had the basement flat and he invited me to a party. And he was working on three different things. He said, I've got this great idea for a Broadway musical I'm gonna start working on. It's called Hello Dolly. Oh no, And uh, oh no. He no longer, when that came out, he no longer was renting any basement flat. And, wow. uh, and he became a great friend. And, but the real story for me began in, well, by the judgment of Paris, I meant I had to choose between going into advertising or staying as a news, that was my judgment. <laughs> that wasn't a big decision, Darwin. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't really, I thought, well, do you want me to write advertising copy? No, he says, we specialize in hiring movie stars and I want you to handle them. Now, he, oh, he said, handle them. They're both be male and female, uh, but handle them. First, you'll be besieged by calls because movie stars will be calling you because they make a hell of a lot of money. Every time they appear in an ad, 
uh, they get a royalty. So he said, they'll be calling you. Your biggest job will be having to turn down a big movie star, which is never pleasant. And so he, um, he said, you'll, for example, if they have to fly to New York and you go to Hollywood, you meet with them, you go over the script with them, you even, if it's a woman, she's particularly concerned with what she will be wearing. Uh, you go over the lines and then you have to then immediately notify us of any objection she or he may have. And if it's moving her from California to New York or him, you have to go with them on the plane. And once, oh. once you get them in New York, don't worry about expense, do anything they want. I said, you mean anything? He said, from what you told me, you've been around kid, you know what I mean by <laughs> and, uh, and so it began. The excitement, the excitement oh. for me that changed my life was in Pasadena, he had two, he and Anne had two weekend parties. He had arrived in Hollywood when there were still some farming villages. He knew everybody. Uh, and I was, baby boomers back then weren't that interested in silent movies. That came later. Now they have film departments at universities and everything. And now I, there were no silent films available really. Uh, I'd heard of Rudolf Valentino, Gloria Swanson, Greta Garbo, but there were tons of others that he would be in, starting to invite to the party. So I found a book of the stars of the silent screen. I started reading it so I would be knowing who I was talking to. His best friend was Philippe de Lacy, who was a child star in the 20s, a beautiful kid from Belgium. Mary Pickford wanted to adopt him and the Guardian <laughs> refused. And at one time, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. were the two most famous people on earth. And Philippe was coming Sunday, and he's arriving with Mary Pickford. I said, I'm going to meet Mary Pickford? <laughs> well, it went on from there. Philippe did love with Greta Garbo. He played her son. It looked like reviewers said they looked like they were making love on the screen. They became great friends. Uh, Love was uh, told stories Anna Karenina later in the 30s. Greta Garbo did a talkie call Anna Karenina. And he said, I'm having a dinner party for eight people. And Anne will sit at the head of the table. I'll, I'll sit at the foot of the table and I'll seat you next to Greta Garbo. And I was still shocked by Mary Pickford. So Greta Garbo was... Well, we got on beautifully, although she wasn't very talkative, but I did most of the talking. And there it went. Gloria Swanson, I did another show with you. Gloria Swanson at first and I became friends, but later on, because of a movie problem, we had a battle in the newspapers and uh, on television. She denounced me on the Murder Griffin show, but you and I have gone into that. We were friends at first. And then, all of a sudden, these incredible people be, uh, started arriving. And as I said, I was the night before, I was finding out who they were, and they were stars. And you didn't hear about these people then. They faded from view. Many had voices that were too accented to be talk in talkies. You know, like the Vilma Banka had a heavy... Uh, Hungarian accent she couldn't get rid of, but they were very important people. So I came up with a million dollar idea, and that was to do a series of books called Whatever Happened to, like, Poland oh. anyway, or uh, Nazimova, or anybody. And um, there was, he had a staff photographer uh, called Phil Vanda. So I was going to run a picture of the star, the way they looked in the twenties and then have Phil take the way they look today. Now okay. some were recognizable. Some had changed really, you wouldn't know what, that it was the same star. And well, it, 
it sounded like a great idea. And it was, and it turned out to be a million dollar idea. However, I was sitting down to do my first book. I'd got the data on all four, 40 stars. And two weeks later, I heard that Richard Lemparski was coming out with a book called Whatever Happened To. And he did the series and uh, he did 11 in all and he made more than a million dollars. Now, a million dollars back then was a lot of money. It could get you through. Today, for a million dollars, you could invite 12 people to a steak and lobster dinner with 12 bottled magnums of champagne. But back then, a million dollars was a lot of money. Now, Okay, but wait, wait, Darwin, did he steal your idea? No, no. Oh. Ma no. Many authors have come up with it. That happens all the time. Oh. Like, for example, in Hollywood, two producers decided to do a movie at the same time on Gene Harlow. I mean, it happens all, all the time. But now, this is the moral of my story. Of course, I was disappointed. Although I had so much going on in my life, I didn't have time for disappointment. But it changed my life because I decided to become a film historian. And of course, you know now I've written maybe 60 Hollywood biographies and I got to see all those silent films. These people enrich my life. I, it's amazing how many people I met and uh, the stories they told me. Many people attacked me because that didn't happen. They didn't know I was talking with the source. You know, young people yeah. born in 1970 who try to write books about Marlon Brando, they don't know Marlon Brando, you right, know, right, and I, right. I did. So in a way, what could be a... a a painful disaster. Of course, I'm sorry I didn't get to carry through with my, my series, but then I started collecting material at these parties. Uh. Um, so I never told you how I got linked up no. with, with, with all the, this was how I did it. It was with my judgment in Paris, where I, I of course, the idea of going into advertising just didn't really appeal to me. Uh, because I didn't want to really write ad copy. But right. what, did, what did appeal to me was, uh, was the, the opportunity that a little barefoot hillbilly boy born in the Blue Ridge Mountains <laughs> would suddenly be seated next to Gloria Swanson and Greta Garbo. I even got to meet someone named Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> and, uh, Darwin. Well, you this see, amazing. back then, uh, oh, and then uh, Mr. Haggard later worked for Hedda Hopper. And now uh, she was the leading gossip columnist yeah. and the rival of Loella Parson. So working for Hedda Hopper, you get to, you know, he got to know everybody. Now, on occasion, can I indulge in a little gossip? Of course, we expect you to. Okay, on occasion, he asked me if I would move out of the cottage for the weekend and come and live with him and Miss Bancroft in the main house. He said, I, he said he used to work for Cary Grant and Randolph Scott when they lived together uh, in the late 30s. He managed their property and everything. And he said, every now and then, Cary Grant and Randolph Scott like to come for old time's sake and spend a weekend undisturbed. They don't want anyone to go there. They want to have a reunion of these. Uh, and of course, at the time, Randolph Scott, if he had $100,000, he turned it into 2 million. He was just racking up. I mean, you know, he. I don't know, you may have seen him in Western movies and stuff. Yes, I have, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and he was, because he's far richer than Cary Grant. And huh. so occasionally, although I, I saw very little of them, although once or twice they came to parties and uh, they, they wanted to keep their relationship undercover, although it's now been written up in a hundred books. <laughs> But back then, they, it was sort of a secret. 
So that's the only time I had to abandon my cot, but I figured it was for a noble cause, right? Well, wait, no I, I have a question for you. When you were working at the Miami Herald and, and all this happened to you, how old were you? Well, I started when I was 19. Ah. And, and uh, I was still in the university. They hired me when I was still in the university. I see. And uh, uh, my greatest triumph was when, uh, I think this had never happened. I got three bylines on the front page in one edition. And that was the triumph back then <laughs> right, of, of, course. Uh, of my life. And uh, well, I don't think they would have sent me to Key West if they knew what a beat that was. I mean, <laughs> you, you, I'm sure, I think you were in Florida at the time. You know, all these Cuban refugees, there were Castro, it was in, enormous news around the world. Right. And then came the Cuban Missile. So right. there's a little kid down there filing one hot story, but I was diverted. And Mr. Haggard and Anne Bancroft diverted me, but it enriched my life. I would never, never have given up the experience that I had. And then I, uh, uh, Mr. Haggard and I, then when people started, uh, well, let's don't use movie stars anymore. I mean, for example, um, we did the Marlboro Man. They said the Marlboro Men were too handsome. They wanted rugged, cowboys and the movie starts things started to fall off but then along came a man called Arthur Fromer who is still alive and he offered what turned out to be a 50-year contract for me to travel around the world and we created a world famous guide series I'm sure you've heard of them uh, the oh Fromer, yes the Fromer guides and the oh, at yes. one time of course, the guidebook industry is over today, but uh, the temptation to go, that was another judgment of Paris. I suddenly found myself traveling the world day and night. Oh, I mean, we went everywhere. I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Hager even rented, oh, he, he and Anne Bancroft remained friends forever. But one night she met Mel Brooks and decided to spend her life with Mel Brooks. And that was in 19, but they, they remain friends as, as I did. So, you know, some of these marriages, Anne had already been married before, but, but with Mel Brooks, she hit it right. And Mel is still alive. He, oh, is he, he really? He's in his nineties now and died, but, but, but Mel is uh, still alive. And, Where does uh, he live, in Hollywood? Yep, yeah. yeah, he does. And uh, they have one son, we won't go into him because it's too personal, but he has okay. one son. And uh, so that's how, you know, what's exciting. I made major decisions that totally uprooted everything I'd been planning for. But yet, except for that loss of whatever happened to, I made it up more. I later did a book on the silent screen, you know? I mean, I did fine. Plus, the knowledge I picked up yeah. about all these movie stars. I know the people attacked me day and night, but they, <laughs> didn't, they well, you know, they, I think they're jealous. Sure, you know, sure. like, like someone did a book on Rock Hudson and attacked me. Well, I knew Rock Hudson, sure. you know, and, uh, but you know, today you're attacked if you do anything, right? And <laughs> uh, if you, if you run, uh, 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 like uh, people who host uh, news shows, they say they get hordes of uh, attack mail. And uh, so I can survive attacks. But, but I want wait, to wait, wait. I want everyone to know I introduced Darwin Porter at the beginning, but he's been talking and I haven't had, uh, been able to interrupt him to tell you. This is Darwin Porter. I think the best celebrity uh, writer uh, in, the, in the world. So I'm so fortunate to have him on our show and write our column every month. You got, you can't miss it. And uh, the books that he's written and I mean, goodness. So, uh, so why don't you tell everybody about the book you're working on right now? The second part two. Well, I'm in the final uh, volume two of a, a woman called Lucille Ball, who at 
1955 was voted the most famous woman in the world. And uh, the queen, but what happens, I found, I read all the Lucy books, they're more concerned with the 50s. When she married her second husband, Gary Morton in 1960, Lucy later years is reduced to almost 10 or 12 pages. But this is a triumph of a woman who reinvented herself after a disaster disastrous marriage and then she went on do you know like two months before her death she was still giving it the last hurrah on television two months before her death she was never a, a year off the, and she went on and did three more series of course it's a sad ending but maybe most of us have sad endings but it, it was a story of a dogged woman's triumph uh, and it's very different from the first book, which is the more romantic uh, phase. And, and then she, got, she met everyone in the world. Uh, uh, Lucille Ball got to appear on television with everyone in the world. And on one of her last shows, she found two refugees from the White House who had been kicked out of the White House named Ronald and Nancy. Reagan. And so they came on. Of course, Reagan was beginning to lose it a little bit by then. But uh, I'll tell you, that was a hell of a woman. Uh, that yes, it was. And, and we're just run out of time, Darwin. I hate to say that because, you know, you, you do get a lot in here every time. So I'm happy about that. And there's no one that knows more about the stars than you. Nobody. And of course, they're going to that's what people do. They criticize, they, you know, they critique everybody. But when it comes down to it, you're, you're the genius. You're the guy. You're the, the one that knows. And we're so happy that you take the time. The one well, thing that I'm so thrilled about is that your memory has been so strong. You're just, you an amazing memory about all this. I'll tell you, I have so many names in my head. You know, every <laughs> book, I mean, the minor names. Of course, we know the big ones, but Right. Like Lucille Ball, oh my God, there are a thousand people that are minor. Of course. In my life. Oh, the, main, the name, but I always will remember who Anita Finley was. And yes, well, Darwin, <laughs> as long as you remember them and not what you had for dinner last night, that's not important. Just remember who you met. And I'm so glad that we met a long time ago and that we've been friends forever and ever. And I'm so happy about that. So thank you very much for the show today. And we'll be back. I know we're working on your next column that uh, we just got. And so that's wonderful. So goodbye, Darwin. Goodbye and bless you. Yeah, I love the show. <laughs>